You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Algeria's coastal and mountain regions were once ruled by the Regency of Algiers, which, although technically part of the Ottoman Empire, pretty much did its own thing without paying much heed to the Ottoman Sultan. The head honcho in the Regency was the Dey, who had tight control over the area around Algiers itself. To manage the rest of the territory, the Dey set up governorates in the western, central, and eastern parts of Algeria. However, beyond these governorates, much of the interior was effectively run by local Berber and Arab leaders who, while supposed to be vassals of the day, often operated independently. Up in the northern Sahara, some oasis kingdoms like the Sultanate of Tugurt were under the Regency's influence. As for the deep Sahara, it was more claimed in name by the day than actually controlled, with local tribes and smaller kingdoms like Kela Hagar really running their own affairs. The day's rule was supported by the Janissaries' support, a group of elite soldiers, though their influence decreased after 1817. Algeria was nestled between the Sultanate of Morocco to the west and the Beylik of Tunis to the east, with the boundary at the Tafna River being quite porous due to shared tribal connections that spanned across it. The Regency of Algiers was notorious as a hub for barbary pirates and slave traders, who preyed on Christian vessels and coastal towns across the Mediterranean and North Atlantic. This area, known as the Barbary Coast, made its living by capturing slaves and goods from Europe, America, and Africa. In response to these attacks, European powers frequently bombarded Algiers, and the United States even initiated the Barbary Wars to stop the Algerian menace on the high seas. The French set their sights on Algeria during the waning days of the Bourbon Restoration under Charles X, aiming to permanently stop the Barbary pirates and boost the king's standing among the French, especially Parisians and veterans of the Napoleonic Wars. The French invasion brought an abrupt end to Algeria's days of pirate glory and slave trading once they took over Algiers. Back in the late 18th century, specifically between 1795 and 1796, the government of France made a deal to buy wheat for their army from two Jewish business owners in Algiers. These businessmen owed money to the local ruler of Algiers, called Hussein Day. They claimed they couldn't pay him back until France settled its debts with them. Hussein Day tried and failed to sort this issue out with Pierre Duval, the French consul, whom he suspected of siding with the merchants, especially since France hadn't made any moves to pay up by 1820. To make matters worse, Duval's nephew, Alexandre, who was the consul in Bonne, upset the Day even more by strengthening French storages in Bonne and Lacaille, going against previous agreements. The trigger for the conflict, known as the Fan Affair, was initially thought to be the unpaid debts. However, David Todd, in his book, A Velvet Empire, French Informal Imperialism in the 19th Century, suggests that the real issue was France's efforts to turn Lacaille into a colonial outpost by fortifying a warehouse there, with the dispute over debts being a secondary issue. This tension exploded into a significant incident on April 29, 1827, during a meeting where Duval didn't give answers that the day found satisfactory, leading the day to hit him with his fly whisk, or what was referred to as a fan. This act was seen as an insult by Charles X, the French king, who demanded an apology from the day and then set up a blockade on Algiers' port. This blockade, which lasted three years, ended up hurting French merchants who couldn't trade with Algiers, though Barbary pirates managed to get around it. A French attempt to negotiate in 1829 was met with cannon fire from the day, signaling that a more forceful approach was necessary. Following this, Charles X appointed Jules, Prince de Polignac, a strong conservative, as president which angered the liberal majority in the French Chamber of Deputies. Polignac tried to negotiate with Muhammad Ali of Egypt to divide North Africa between their powers, but this plan fell through. Facing rising opposition at home, Polignac and the king believed that capturing Algiers would boost public support for them. Admiral Dupere took the helm of a massive fleet of 635 ships in Toulon and set off for Algiers. This move was part of a larger plan to invade Algeria a strategy that was originally brainstormed by Major Bouton under Napoleon's orders back in 1808. On the ground, General de Bourmont took charge, landing an impressive force of 34,000 soldiers near Algiers at Sidi Farouche on June 14, 1830. Facing them, the day of Algiers pulled together a defense force including 7,000 elite Janissaries, a combined army of 19,000 from the regions of Constantine and Oran, and around 17,000 local Kabyle fighters. Thanks to their superior firepower and better organization, 
The French forces quickly established a strong position on the beach and started their advance toward Algiers. On June 19th, they managed to beat the day's army at Stoueli, and by July 5th, just three weeks later, they entered Algiers. The day surrendered, negotiating his freedom and the security of his personal wealth. Within five days, he left for exile in Naples with his family. Following this, the Turkish Janissaries also left the territory for Turkey, ending over three centuries of Ottoman control. However, despite promises to respect the liberties, properties, and religious freedoms of Algiers' residents, French troops started looting the city, arresting and killing people for unclear reasons, taking property, and disrespecting sacred sites as soon as they arrived. By mid-August, the last Turkish officials were forced out, leaving without the chance to secure their assets. Reports suggest that the plundering redirected more than 50 million francs in assets to private hands. This behavior significantly marred the future relationship between the French forces and the local population. An 1833 French commission lamented that the French had unnecessarily killed people on mere suspicion, acted with greater cruelty than the people they were criticizing, and triggered immediate resistance to French rule due to the vacuum of power their actions created. The news of Algiers' fall barely reached Paris when Charles X was overthrown during the July Revolution, replaced by Louis-Philippe as the head of a constitutional monarchy. Initially, the new liberal government was skeptical about continuing the invasion, which was a project of their predecessors. Yet the public was thrilled with the victory, and the government decided to keep a significant portion of the force in Algeria. General Bormont, who had also captured Bon and Oran, thought about using his forces to reinstate Charles, but abandoned the idea upon realizing his troops were not with him. He resigned and went into exile in Spain, and Louis-Philippe appointed Bertrand Clausel to take over in September 1830. In an effort to resist the French, the Bay of Tittery, a participant in the Battle of Stauali, tried to unite with the Bays of Oran and Constantine. However, they couldn't come to an agreement on leadership. In November, Clausel led a French column of 8,000 to Medea, capital of Tittery, encountering minimal resistance and only losing 200 men in minor battles. After leaving a garrison in Blida, he took Medea without a fight, as the bay had already withdrawn. In Algiers, Clausel established a formal government system and began recruiting local forces known as Zouaves to strengthen the French military presence, aiming to solidify French colonial dominance. He and his colleagues initiated a strategy to purchase farmland and attract European settlers, initiating a land rush. Clausel viewed the Matija Plain as an ideal area for agriculture, particularly for large-scale cotton production. During his second term as Governor General from 1835 to 1836, Clausel invested in land personally and encouraged his army officers and officials to do the same. This action deepened the engagement of French government officials in Algeria. Similarly, business interests, recognizing a profit opportunity in land, advocated for the expansion of French-controlled territories, leading to the creation of large farms, factories, and businesses that utilized inexpensive local labor. Clausel also attempted to extend French authority to Oran and Constantine by suggesting to the Bay of Tunis the appointment of local leaders under French supervision. The Bay, foreseeing potential conflict, refused. The French foreign ministry disapproved of Clausel's negotiations with Morocco regarding the establishment of a Moroccan Bay in Oran, resulting in Clausel being replaced by Baron Berthezane in early 1831. Baron Berthezane, who was not supportive of colonization and viewed as a weak leader, experienced his most significant military failure while trying to support the Bey at Medea, who had become unpopular among locals due to his alliance with the French and corrupt actions. The withdrawal from Medea was plagued by assaults from Kabyle warriors, resulting in nearly 300 French casualties. This episode prompted calls for a more assertive policy, which was answered by Louis-Philippe's appointment of Savary, Duke of Rovigo, at the end of 1831. Rovigo succeeded in reclaiming Bone and Bougie, now known as Bejaya, territories lost by Clausel, and persisted with the colonization of land and expropriation of properties. His severe methods in quelling opposition in Algiers led to his dismissal in 1833, with Baron Voral succeeding him. Voral affirmed French control over Oran, and General Louis-Alexis Desmachels was placed in charge of Arzu and Mostaganem. On June 22, 1834, France formally declared the occupied territories of Algeria, inhabited by about two million Muslims, a military colony under the governance of a military governor endowed with extensive powers. Initially, French governance was to be confined to coastal regions, but as France aimed to widen its territory, local resistance continued. 
The policy of restricted territorial dominance was abandoned in 1840 in favor of complete control. Voral was succeeded in 1834 by Jean-Baptiste Drouet, Count of Erlon, who was responsible for addressing the challenge posed by Abd al-Qadir and the ongoing issues with Ahmed Bey, the ruler of Constantine. Abd al-Qadir ibn Muhyiddin, famously known as Emir Abd al-Qadir, was born in May 1807 in the Algerian province of Oran. Coming from a prominent and religious family with a father who was both a religious leader and a marabout, Abd al-Qadir had the privilege of receiving a well-rounded education. From a young age, he immersed himself in a wide array of subjects, including Islamic sciences, Quran, as well as Greek and Arabian philosophies, history, and even medicine and astronomy. By the age of 14, he earned the title of Hafiz and was known for his deep knowledge of the Quran, which he shared in his family's mosque. At 18, he embarked on the Hajj with his father, and they also furthered their studies by traveling to Damien and later to Baghdad. In 1832, Abdel Qadir's father, Muhyiddin, who had previously stood up against the ruling authorities and even faced imprisonment, waged attacks against the French forces at Oran. That same year, Abdel Qadir, at the age of 25, was chosen by local tribal leaders to lead a jihad, stepping into his father's shoes. Alexis de Tocqueville, a member of parliament at the time, detailed Abdel Qadir's rise to leadership in his 1837 letter on Algeria. He highlighted Abdel Qadir's family's veneration and their long standing resistance against foreign rule. Emphasizing Abdel Qadir's piety, pilgrimage experiences, and prophesied role, Tocqueville showed how Abdel Qadir was unanimously proclaimed leader of the believers. Quickly accepted as Amir al Mu'minin, or commander of the faithful, Abdel Qadir secured the support of Western tribes and in 1834 negotiated a treaty with General Desmachel, recognizing him as the ruler over specific territories in Oran not occupied by France. This treaty allowed him to expand his influence without having to acknowledge French authority directly, a point the French conveniently overlooked in the treaty's text. Despite attempts by subsequent French commanders to weaken his support, Abdel Qadir demonstrated his resilience and military acumen. For instance, when General Camille Alphonse Trezel tried to break the allegiance of tribes near Oran to Abdel Qadir, the emir took decisive action by relocating those tribes and even declared war by withdrawing his consul from Oran after a provocative exchange with French. This led to several military engagements, including the significant Battle of Makta, where Abdel Qadir's forces decisively defeated the French, causing significant losses. However, the French didn't relent. General Clausel, replacing the unsuccessful Derlan, led new campaigns against Abdel Qadir, capturing territories and applying military pressure. Abdel Qadir, known for his guerrilla warfare tactics, faced a significant defeat in the Battle of Sikak by forces under Thomas Robert Bougeau, a seasoned military leader. This battle proved a turning point, as Abdel Qadir then limited his resistance to guerrilla tactics, avoiding direct confrontations when possible. Ahmed Bey was firmly opposed to any efforts by the French or other forces to take control of Constantine, and he was active in fighting against French domination, partly because he hoped to one day become the day himself. His diplomatic discussions with Clausel turned sour over Ahmed's refusal to accept French dominance over Bone, which Ahmed saw as rightfully Algerian. Consequently, Clausel took military action. In November 1836, Clausel headed an army of 8,700 troops into the Constantine region, only to be pushed back during the Battle of Constantine. This setback led to Clausel being sent back home. He was succeeded by the Comte de Damremont, who managed to take Constantine in the next year's expedition, although he lost his life during the siege. After his death, Sylvain Charles, Comte Valet, took over his role. Back in May 1837, General Thomas Robert Bugeaud, who was in charge of Oran at the time, struck a deal called the Treaty of Tafna with a leader named Abd al-Qadir. This agreement essentially gave Abd al-Qadir the green light to run the show over a large part of what we now know as Algeria. Using this treaty, Abd al-Qadir was able to tighten his grip on power by bringing various tribes under his control and even went on to build new cities far from French influence. He encouraged people living under French rule to resist through both peaceful means and warfare. Before the French came along, Algeria was a patchwork of feuding clans and brotherhoods. But Abd al-Qadir managed to bring some order by dividing the territory he controlled into districts, each tasked with its own defense. Looking to challenge the French once more, he claimed a stretch of territory under the treaty that was key for travel between Algiers and Constantine. However, when French troops marched through a mountain pass known as the Iron Gates in late 1839, 
Abd al-Qadir saw it as a violation of their agreement and called for a holy war, or jihad, against them. In 1839, he kicked off the Matija campaign with leaders like the Kabyle commander Ahmed bin Salam and the Arab Muhammad bin Alel taking charge. Despite some victories, the campaign saw some defeat like at the Battle of Wed el Alug. Throughout 1840, Abd al-Qadir led a guerrilla warfare against the French in Algiers and Oran. Due to his inability to put an end to the conflict, Valet was replaced by General Bougo in December 1840. Bougeot introduced a harsh strategy that involved burning land and using fast-moving cavalry units, similar to Abd al-Qadir's tactic, to slowly capture territory from him. This approach was brutal, causing great suffering among the population. Eventually, Abd al-Qadir was pushed to operate a traveling headquarters called a Smala or Zmila. In 1843, while Abd al-Qadir was away, French forces attacked this camp, capturing over 5,000 of his fighters and seizing his resources. Forced into a corner, Abd al-Qadir retreated to Morocco, where he had been getting some support, especially from tribes near the border. When France couldn't persuade Morocco diplomatically to kick Abd al-Qadir out, they decided to use military pressure and initiated the First Franco-Moroccan War in 1844 to force the Sultan's hand. In 1845, the French focused on the Kabylia region, aiming to wipe out Abd al-Qadir's support there. This region had been a thorn in France's side since 1837, launching ambushes like the Battle of Beni Mered. After defeating Ahmed in the Battle of Tizi Ouzou and ambushing the remaining Algerian forces near Isers, the French managed to dismantle Abd al-Qadir's base in the east. By decade's end, France had over 100,000 soldiers in occupation there. Morocco, under Abd al-Rahman, after the 1844 Treaty of Tangi, officially banned Abd al-Qadir from its territories. However, Abd al-Rahman still tried to undermine Abd al-Qadir, sending attacks his way that eventually failed. After surviving these attempts and winning several battles against Moroccan forces, Abd al-Qadir decided to surrender to the French in December 1847, on the condition that he could go into exile in the Middle East. Unfortunately, the French didn't honor this agreement immediately holding him until 1852, when he was finally allowed to move to Damascus. Interestingly, the Ottomans never officially accepted the loss of Algeria as part of their empire. Even in a map from 1905, they showed Algeria as having a border with Morocco, treating it more as a vaguely defined territory rather than a completely lost province. In 1871, Algeria witnessed its most significant uprising against French rule since Abd al-Qadir's resistance, known as the Mokrani Revolt, which unfolded across the Kabylia region and rapidly spread to much of the country. By April of that year, about 250 tribes, making up nearly a third of Algeria's population, had joined the rebellion. At this point, there were around 130,000 European settlers in Algeria who controlled most of the fertile land, a number which would escalate to more than a million by the end of the century. The rebellion was sparked by a prolonged famine and unfair treatment of different ethnic groups by the colonial administration, leading to widespread dissatisfaction. The aftermath saw the French crackdown on the uprising, culminating in the trial of the revolt's surviving leaders in Constantine in 1873. A significant backdrop to the discontent was the Cremieux Decree of 1870, which had profound impacts on the local population's sentiment. The revolt was orchestrated by Sheikh Mokrani, the leader of the Kala of Eight Abbas, who had previously been an ally of the French government. A key factor fueling the revolt was the growing sense among the Kabyl community and their leaders that they were losing autonomy over their decision, particularly evident in the disempowerment of the Kala of Eight Abbas and the local village assemblies known as Jama. Additionally, the 1871 Paris Commune may have inspired the Kabyles by showing that resistance against the French authorities was possible. The immediate catalyst for the widespread revolt was a mutiny by a Spahi soldier who refused to follow French orders. This led to an armed uprising involving around 150,000 Kabyles, who although mostly untrained and ill-equipped, were driven by a desire for freedom. Initially, the rebels saw some success, but the tide turned when French forces stepped up their military response, eventually quashing the revolt with the capture of Cheikh Mokrani's brother, among other actions. Notably, some of the insurgents were exiled to New Caledonia, creating a community of Algerians in the Pacific that persists to this day. In March 1844, the French set out on a mission to take over the Sahara, beginning their journey in Biskra, a key spot close to Constantine in the Zibra region. Leading them was a young 22-year-old general, Louis-Philippe, Duke of Omal. 
They were forced to find a new way to reach Constantine because of the strong opposition they faced from the Emir Abdel Qadir and the Bey of Constantine, Haji Ahmed. Initially, the Sahara didn't seem like a valuable target for the French due to its dry and seemingly unimportant location. However, the French managed to adopt a strategy that involved less violence by making deals with certain local tribes. Not everyone was against the French. Some local leaders didn't support Abdel Qadir's resistance and even formed alliances with the French. This made resistance in those areas much harder and also wasn't seen favorably by the local communities. With time, the French could handle the revolts through these alliances and when needed, by force. By 1881, the French had full control over the Algerian coast. Yet the previous struggles in the Sahara made the idea of taking over the entire region seem unlikely. However, competition with the British Empire and the killing of Lieutenant Colonel Paul Flatters by Touareg forces prompted another French military campaign. In 1902, this campaign led them into the Hagar Mountains, where they defeated the Kel Ahagar forces in a battle at Tit. By 1903, France had taken over the kingdom of Kel Ahagar, marking the completion of their conquest in the Saharan lands of Algeria. The French approach was to use a divide-and-rule tact along with surrounding their foes from different directions. The Tuareg, despite being lightly armed, were formidable foes due to their deep knowledge of the terrain and their ability to endure harsh climate conditions. Not everyone in France saw the Sahara expedition as essential, given the numerous challenges and uncertainties it presented. Historians point out that the French tactics for taking control over Algeria were extremely harsh, resulting in death tolls that suggest genocide. Between 500,000 and 1 million Algerians died from warfare, famine, and disease in the first 30 years of the French conquest, from an initial population of around 3 million. During this time, from 1830 to 1862, France itself suffered significant losses, with 480,000 people dead, including both civilians and soldiers. When it comes to the interactions between the French colonizers and the Kabyle communities in Algeria, it led to the formation of a unique relationship. The French saw the Kabyles as distinct from other Algerians, partly due to cultural differences, such as the practice of monogamy among the Kabyle. The French used this perceived difference to justify their rule, aiming to create a relationship that seemed legitimate. Part of this effort involved a push for Christianity and the introduction of French cultural and educational systems to Algeria. Notably, this included missions like the Alliance Israelite Universelle, aimed at the Jewish community. From the 1850s, following the Cremieux Decree, there was a significant push by France to mold the education of the Jewish and Kabyl populations. The goal was to cultivate loyalty to France and encourage assimilation into French culture and behaviors. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.